Sonder, a word used to describe the profound feeling of realizing every stranger around you has a life as complex and important as your own. It's also the name of the town I grew up in. Sonder lies on the eastern coast of the UK, on the north side of England. If you reach Scotland, you've gone too far. But if you're in Scarborough, you've not gone far enough. It sits somewhere between there, though I don't think anyone could be more specific. You see, you can't find it on any map. Printed or digital, new or old, color-coded or satellite imagery, there is no sign of this town existing at all. If you pay enough attention online, you'll find the odd few people mentioning the place. Like this that you're reading right now. Like a whisper passing by in a busy place. You only know it's there if you're looking for it. Yet to a vast majority of the world, Sonder is just a word. I was born there, and raised within its confines. I moved away at 15, about 10 years ago. It was a peaceful seaside village. The type where everyone knows each other. The type where when someone hosts a get-together, all residents are invited. It was a close-knit community. I still remember it with mostly fond memories. The waves lapping onto the sand all through the night. The cobbled streets scorching your bare feet as you walked back from the beach on a summer's day. The dark woods that overlooked the town from High Hill. High Hill is what we called the hill that stood next to Saunder. It blocked any chance of a view to other towns or cities. We resided in a valley at the edge of the sea, and whilst we liked it there, it felt very secluded. The town had a few small businesses. My favorite was Uncle Pete's Pizza. Everyone called him Uncle Pete, although he wasn't actually anybody's uncle. But his pizza place was perfectly between our home and my mom's pub. Every Friday, she would pick up a pizza on the way home. Absolutely no exceptions. Me and my older brother Jacob were always excited for this. Much of the town had been there for generations, the population naturally getting smaller as more and more of it became family. But a few people would move there every now and then. All of them found the town in the same way, a leaflet coming through the letterbox while searching for somewhere to move to. Every single time, the same story. They were driven here by a house moving service. I guess with no directions or map, it would be difficult to make your own way here. They were lovely, they really helped us, they would always say. Nobody ever really seemed to question it much. I mean, it's not like we were trapped. We could leave whenever we wanted. Make no mistake, Sonder was no prison. It didn't even feel like one. It's just difficult to find. And leaving just felt... icky. Like you shouldn't do it. As the internet became mainstream, it became more and more obvious to people that the town was so hard to find. Suddenly people had friends from outside of Sonder, but they could never visit because they could never seem to find their way in. GPS signal was weak, and opening any app on your phone that tracked your location wouldn't pinpoint you. One truly odd thing about Sonder was the appliances. All of them had the same logo on somewhere, the letter V in a circle. Since leaving, I've tried to research this company, but to no avail. The moving company that people arrived in also had this logo on their vans. The town had its issues, none more known than the Scream Singers. At night, if you listened hard enough, you could hear them. A chilling, soft sound. It was almost like a distant scream, yet more melodic. Something enchanting, yet fills you with dread. Nobody ever saw them, but someone in the town would go missing every now and then, maybe once or twice a year. Some lived alone and hadn't been seen in a few days before anyone realized. Some were cuddled up to their partner in bed, only for their partner to wake up with them no longer in their arms. The only thing they had in common is that there was never any sign of entry or struggle. My entire life I've known the echoes over the valley to mean trouble, but my mother used to tell me stories of when the townsfolk thought they meant hope. A simpler time. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly when people made the connection between the disappearances and the whistles in the night, but they would always start a few weeks before a disappearance, and stop the night after someone had gone missing. This had always intrigued me, but not as much as it did my brother. Jacob found it fascinating, perhaps because he had never had someone close to him taken and didn't understand the pain. To him, it was just a mystery, wrapped in questions. Some believed the Scream Singers to be the ones taking these people, 
Some believe their calls to be a warning that something darker is coming. Whatever people believe their intentions to be, everyone knew that their somber singing over Sonder was only bad news. My fond memories of the town become clouded when the trauma of my final days there enters my mind again. Years of therapy have helped me cope, but I feel talking about it publicly is the final thing that may bring me peace. As far as I know, I am the only person to have seen a scream singer, or at least the only living person. It was the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the 21st of June. Sonder has always held a small festival on this day. It dated back almost a century at the time, being the 97th consecutive solstice celebration. The festival took place not during those long sunlight hours, but as the sun began to set and the longest day ceased at about 9.30 p.m. But the town of Sonder felt more melancholy than usual, especially for the festivities that were going on. The scream singers had started their wails again about three weeks prior, getting louder and louder each passing night. Sure enough, about an hour after the festival began, you could faintly hear the noises again, piercing through the sweeter melodies of the festival and the chatter of the crowds. People tried to ignore it and continue the celebrations, but every time the wind blew in just a particular way to make the noises more prominent, you could see the look on everyone's faces. The unspoken, silent fear washing through the crowds like a wave. My mum's pub, really, our family pub, was right at the festival. As such, the doors were wide open and people kept coming in and out. It was always one of the busiest nights of the year. Me and Jacob were sat drinking red wine. He was 17 and had a proper glass, but I still had half lemonade in mine. It was the only night of the year I was allowed to drink alcohol. The festival was still going strong when Jacob had the idea to go a little out of town and get a better listen to the scream singers. I was hesitant, but I was always up for an adventure. So half reluctantly, I agreed. We got a few streets away before the howling became louder than the music. We were stood in the perfect mix of unknown to one side and enjoyment to the other. We should not have kept going. But we did. We reached the final building before the cobbled streets turned to grass and mud and didn't stop there. Without saying a word to each other, it was like we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to be the first people to have seen the scream singers, the first to understand them. We didn't know that only one of us would catch a glimpse. High Hill was steep, but not too steep. You didn't need your hands to climb it, it just took a lot of energy. Every now and then we looked back at Sonder. You would almost think it was a ghost town from how dark it looked, if not for the bright festival right in the center. The only clue of any life, all packed together. The sounds of cheering, singing, and music echoed up the hill. All the while, the sounds of ghostly wails echoed down. A battle between good and evil. Not seen, but only heard. As we reached the dark woods, we looked at each other. It felt like we hadn't spoken in ages, so I broke that. We're really doing this, Jacob nodded. I knew he would, I just needed to say something. Hearing nothing but ghostly screeches was driving me insane. We wandered around in there for what seemed like forever, though it was closer to maybe five minutes. Every slight crunch made me flinch and turn around. There was never anything there but the haunting screams which were all around us. We reached a clearing, and the sounds of the scream singers seemed louder than ever. In the center of the clearing was a rock, about as tall as me and a little wider. Jacob held me, as he could clearly tell I was scared. It's, it's all right, it's just sounds. There's nothing to be afraid of. Maybe we should head back. His words didn't comfort me. They only told me one thing. He couldn't see what I could see. Stood on the rock is something I will never get out of my mind. A tall, gray figure, about twice as tall as any human I'd ever seen. It had two arms, but only one hand. The hand it had looked what I can only describe as twisted. Its fingers weaved together in a way that didn't make sense, and certainly wasn't natural. The shape of it was overall humanoid, but the proportions were all wrong. It had no eyes, at least not at first. I was terrified looking at this thing, but the moment my heart truly dropped was when eyes appeared. 
they slowly came out of its skin. There was no evidence that this creature should even have eyes. There was no holes for them. But as its face opened in a mesmerizingly disturbing way, I saw two eyes slowly come forward. The face closed again, with the eyes looking right at us. There were only two eyes. I counted them. One. Two. Its face opened up again as it let out a horrific scream. I ran. I ran faster than I ever have before in my life, only occasionally looking behind me to make sure Jacob was running with me. He was, but he wasn't running from the scream singer. He was only running to catch up with me. He had no idea why I was so scared at that moment. We ran all the way down High Hill, nearly tripping over. Running down a steep hill is difficult at the best of times. As we got back onto the cobbled streets, I turned around and looked up at the woods. No sign of anything chasing us, but the screams were still so loud, even down here. By this point, Jacob had caught up and was right beside me. He kept asking why I was running, but I was too shocked to answer him yet. We ran another street and he reached out to hold me. I stopped running and let him hug me. He told me that whatever I saw, it was going to be okay, and that we were safe. I closed my eyes with tears streaming down my face. I opened my mouth and began to explain what I saw, getting words out between choking on my tears. It was this gray thing on the rock. You could see the rock, right? Well, uh, on top. I realized the howling had stopped. I opened my eyes. Jacob wasn't there. I was standing in the middle of the street with my arms out, hugging nobody. I looked up to my right and could see the festival. I felt empty and confused. I walked through the crowd, tears still streaming down my face. I found my mother at the bar and she asked me where I had been and if I knew where Jacob was. I told her everything and she closed up for the night. We both knew that the scream singers had claimed their next victim. She wasn't angry at me for going to the woods. She held me tight and neither of us spoke a word. We just wept and wept until we were too tired and empty to weep anymore. The next day was Friday. I got out of bed in the morning after absolutely no sleep. My mom was downstairs, packing boxes. She told me we were leaving that same day. Within an hour we were in her car, driving away from home. We passed Uncle Pete's Pizza. I realized this is the first Friday in my life that we weren't eating from there. As we drove further away from the sea, and I saw outside of that small town for the first time, I already knew that leaving our life behind would not fix anything. Saunder is still out there. I hope somebody can find it.